Hi guys, it's Emily from Doa Deer Nursery and I'm here with little Mr. Camden. I've just started on his painted hair and I put a post up on Instagram saying that it was my painting day asking you if you guys had any questions or tags you'd like me to answer while I was painting. Um, but then I remembered that I still have a bunch of unanswered questions um, from several weeks back when my friend Shanine and I met up and did a um, several reborn outings and we posted a joint Q&A and tag request post. Alright, so, oh do you want to say who the questions are by? I mean a lot of them are by the same person so maybe not. Yeah, I mean we can. And there were several questions that were more reborn artists directed that we decided we wouldn't answer in that post and I thought I would come back to later and frankly I completely forgot about it so I'm going back to that post now and I'm going to go ahead and answer as many of those questions as I can while I work on this little boy's painted hair. So forgive me if I kind of stop and pause in between. If I get really focused on a certain stroke or something, I may get a little distracted. Okay, so the first question is, what size babies do you prefer to paint? Um, and this is a really great question, I think because it kind of, my answer kind of changes um, from time to time. I would say um, most often though, I really like to paint newborn size babies between about like 18 to 20, maybe 21 inches. Um, I think that's just kind of my sweet spot size in general. Those are the ones I like to collect most. Um, they're also the ones I like to paint most. Um, now the reason is with super, super tiny babies like Camden here, who's only 16 inches, um, who seems maybe even a tad bit smaller than that to me, while he's really fun to paint, the tiny, tiny detail work can be really difficult. The eyebrows have to be really fine. Even my painted hair strokes have to be even thinner than usual. All my mottling has to be about half the size it usually is. So that can be a little bit tricky. And then with bigger babies or older babies, um, I find that they tend to, I don't wanna say they're less realistic because that's certainly not the case at all. Um, but they don't get the same amount of painting detail um, just because newborn babies have more of a dynamic complexion. They've got lots of mottling and stork bites and red marks and their veins are pretty apparent. And I, as babies get older, um, those details tend to fade and become more subtle. So I just think they're not as dynamic to paint. Um, so yeah, I think that mid-size, like 18, 19, 20 inch babies, oh, there goes my washing machine in the background. Those are probably my favorite to paint. All right, so the next question um, says, are glass beads the only way to weight a reborn? Um, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, there are definitely several options. I know some people like to use um, steel or metal kind of pellets. They almost look like BB gun pellets. Um, there are all sorts of ways, but for me personally, the only way I use is um, glass beads. And the reason is with something like a steel pellet, I feel like they're just kind of large. And even with all the polyfill and stuffing um, inside the kit, or excuse me, inside the cloth body, you can still kind of feel them, um, and I don't like the way that feels. With glass beads, they're so fine that they just kind of move with the doll and move within the cloth body very naturally. And when they're contained in a pair of pantyhose or knee-high stockings or something like that, um, you know, they don't slip around inside the body, they're well contained. So that's the way I like to weight my babies, but it certainly isn't the only way. Um, the next question is belly plate or no belly plate? I feel like I may have answered this before, but I'm going to answer it just from a reborn artist perspective. Um, I love to paint a belly plate. I think it's just, um, it gives me as an artist a fun surface to work on. You can really see a lot of the detail in a belly plate because it is just one big relatively flat surface. 
versus kind of narrow arms and legs or a very kind of rounded sculpted head where you know the details may kind of like may, except for the top of the head or the back of the head you may not see them very clearly so I do really like to paint a tummy plate um, I generally I don't super love doing very full or anatomically correct tummy plates I'm not sure why it's not that it makes me uncomfortable or anything I think I just prefer the look of a half tummy plate where it's just the chest and shoulders and then down to the belly button. Um, that's just my personal preference, but I will paint um, all different types. Um, so yeah, definitely yes to the belly plate. Um, let's see. I think I did answer this with Neen, um, but I'll answer it again just in case. It says, what sculpt or limited edition kit would you love to get your hands on? Um, I think when I did answer it, it was really from the perspective of my personal collection, what would I like? So this will be more what I would like to paint. Um, I would love to paint Jaden Scholl. I think that's a fantastic kit. Um, I would love to paint... Gosh, there are so many. Um, a lot of Gudrun Legler sculpts. Um, one I actually have, Casper by Krista Goetzen. He is a sold out limited edition kit that I absolutely love and I've just kind of hoarded in my um, kit collection for a long time and I'm actually really glad I did because when I first got that kit I was still kind of a newer Reborn artist and while I think he would have turned out nice um, I don't think he would have turned out nearly as nice as he will now that I've gained more experience and practice more um, and just have a better understanding of how to best bring that kit to life. So that is one I do have. I have gotten my hands on it and I'm really, really excited um, to paint it. All right, so the next question gets a bit more into the business aspect of being a Reborn artist. And it says... When did you first start doing customs and how did you know how much to charge? Um, so I don't, honestly, I don't exactly remember when I first started doing customs. I think it just sort of happened naturally where I had painted several dolls and was just selling them as they were completed. Um, and I started having people just message me about, oh, do you do customs? Could you make me a this kit? Could you make me a that kit? Um, and I think one day I just felt confident enough and said, yes, you know, I can. Um, and I was always very open about my experience level, letting people know I was a fairly new artist and this and that, but they still wanted to move forward. And so that's how um, it started. And then soon enough, I was doing almost all customs with just a few make to sell babies in between. Um, so how did I know how much to charge? That question is a little tricky, and I've kind of addressed this in the past um, in some tag questions and things like that, just about how um, as your skill improves and as the number of hours you dedicate to each doll increases, your prices will naturally go, go up. That's a normal, natural progression. But when I first started, you know, I didn't have the same skill level and I wasn't dedicating as many hours simply because I didn't you know know all these new techniques that now take me lots of time so it was really just kind of um, making sure to add a little bit on of an artistry fee and then the cost of the kit and supplies so I think when I first started it was fairly low I it gave myself only about maybe a $100 profit margin. So for example, I would say, you know, um, that like a real born kit, which is around $80, would be about a $210 doll because I would spend about um, $80 on the kit, $20 on the body, about $10 on additional supplies like stuffing, weighting, zip ties, um, all that good stuff. And then that left about a $100 profit for myself. Um, and I think that got me a fairly good amount of orders, uh, just because that's really, really low for a really low price for the custom reborn industry. But of course, my dolls were um, not low quality. I would never call them low quality. They were just the level of a new artist with limited experience. 
Um, and then when I started doing painted hair more regularly, I would offer painted hair as an additional cost. Um, so really it just kind of um, grew as I improved my skill. And so now at this point, now that I spend probably about twice as many hours on my dolls as I used to when I first began, and I know several new techniques, and I now do painted hair and rooted lashes and all those um, things like that, my prices generally start at about $325 plus the cost of the kit, which, yes, is significantly more than a $100 plus cost of kit, but I'm also working a lot harder in terms of my number of hours, and my uh, end result dolls, I feel, are much more realistic. Okay, um, which kits do you prefer, silicone or vinyl kits? I'll say vinyl simply because I've never painted a silicone. Um, I really, really admire artists who do. I know it requires a whole new painting technique and different set of paints, and it's very labor intensive, so I really admire that. Um, I don't want to say that I'll never do silicone because who knows what the world may bring, and maybe one day I'll just be really interested. But as of now, I'm pretty comfortable sticking with, um, with vinyl kits. All right, so the next question is, what kit is the hardest to paint? Um, now that's kind of a, a difficult question to answer with a specific kit, because there really is no one specific kit that's difficult to paint. I just think there are certain things about kits that are difficult to paint. Um, the first one I would say is maybe a kit that's not a super realistic sculpt, um, which may sound a little counterintuitive, but the reason that is for me is I feel like when you have a sculpt, such as like um, Bonnie Brown's Twin A and Twin B, or Scarlet, or... Um, Gosh, there are just there are countless kits that are so beautifully done. Tate by Andrea Arcello. Just these real, really realistic sculpts with lots of details. Most kits by Laura Lee Eagles. Um, your painting obviously brings the kit to life and enhances the realism, but it was already beautifully realistic to begin with. Now with a kit, and I won't name any specifics, but maybe like a less expensive kit or an older kit that was released many years ago before sculptors really started coming out with these fabulously realistic kits, you have to work extra hard with your painting to make it look realistic. You know, you have to shade areas that normally you wouldn't shade, and you have to um, deepen parts of the kit that maybe weren't sculpted as deep as you would have liked. Um, you have to create height and depth and color and dimension in places where it just kind of doesn't exist in the sculpt. So that is definitely something that I find hard to paint. Um, another thing is certain vinyls um, are really difficult to get paint to really adhere or to show with the level of intensity that you'd like. Um, for example, as much as I absolutely love Bonnie Brown sculpts, um, I find that the vinyl, in certain areas, I really sometimes struggle to get the paint to adhere. And I've talked to some other artists about this, so I was really relieved that it's not just me, that other artists have experienced this too. Um, in certain places, like the knuckles and the back of the head and the heels of the feet, it's just really a battle to get paint to go on. Um, and then really thin vinyls, like the Sansa Kit by Ping Lao. Again, one of my favorite sculpts. So beautiful, so cute. But the vinyl's really thin, and the paint just doesn't want to adhere with full um, intensity. So that's definitely a struggle. Okay. Um, good kit to paint for beginners. Um, I would just say go with something inexpensive. When you're a beginner, um, you don't want to drop, you know, 120 bucks on a, um, a limited edition kit. I know that, for example, I have some kits I painted when I first started, and I kind of just wish I had hung on to those kits until I had more experience, because I know that they would have been better for it, um, and that they were really expensive kits that I painted, you know, 
very well for my abilities at the time, but looking back, I'm like, oh, I could have done this and I could have done that, but I didn't know how to do yet. Um, so yeah, go with inexpensive. Um, don't go with something really big or really small. You want to go again with that kind of like sweet spot size, something between like 19 to 20 inches, because um, then I think it's just easier to handle the kit that way. So yeah, cheap and medium size, that's what I recommend. So the next question is, why did you start making Reborns? Um, and I definitely answered this before in my Reborn story video, which I'll link down below if you wanna go watch that. Um, but I'll give you kind of a short answer, which is really just, I was super interested. I had just started collecting Reborns on my own and just found it to be such a unique and amazing art form that I just really kind of wanted to get my hands on it, if that makes sense. I really wanted to be a part of it, and um, I've always been a creative artistic person. I've always had a lot of artistic pursuits, and at that point in my life, I was incredibly busy um, as a student and working full time, and just felt like I didn't have any creative outlets at the, at the time that um, really intrigued me. So even though I was really busy, um, it felt good to have, you know, to take some me time and work on something really creative um, that made me feel good. And having, you know, a beautiful end result made me feel really productive and proud. So that's kind of why I started making Reborns. I didn't, when I started, I didn't plan to make it a business. I just sort of thought like, oh, you know, I'll make a few Reborns here and there. When I really, really want to keep one, I'll keep it. If it was just a good practice one, then I'll sell it, and maybe someone will buy it. You know, I didn't go into it planning, like, I'm going to learn how to do this, and I'm going to make it a business, and eventually I'll do customs. It was strictly just for fun, which I think is part of the reason my business is, has become somewhat successful, is because I had these really... Um, genuine intentions going in that it was just going to be a fun creative outlet and then just by chance uh, it became a business all right um the next question is what would you get to start reborning or advice for people who want to start reborning um, i definitely recommend getting a like pre-packaged reborn making kit um, because it can be really difficult to pin down each and every item you need to begin reborning. It's a really long list of supplies. Um, so I recommend the Bountiful Baby Reborn Starter Kits. They come with um, paints, brushes, a kit, stuffing, waiting, pantyhose, zip ties, um, a whole list of things. There are still a few other things you'll need to get. Um, like uh, mineral spirits and thinners, but I think that's a really, really good place to start, and I definitely recommend it. Um, in terms of tutorials, the Bountiful Baby Starter Kit does come with a tutorial, but I remember when I first watched it, feeling kind of like I watched it from beginning to end, and went, that's it? Where's all the motling? Where's the this? Where's the that? Um, so look into tu some tutorials. I like Precious Little Baby Dust, and just YouTube. YouTube is a great, great resource for learning how to reborn. But anyway, guys, I think that's all the questions I'm going to answer for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.